Well, again, want to welcome you to Chapel Hill Church. I hope that you're leaning in and ready for the word today. Wasn't worship awesome? Come on, somebody just be a witness. I got to just say this. From time to time, I'll say something like this, but I feel like today is one of those days where, uh, you know, God gave me the opportunity to travel to many, many churches around this nation and outside this nation. And I'm telling you, there is something special about what we have here at Chapel Hill. And I just think we ought to just let the worship team know how much we appreciate them. <laughs> phenomenal, man. Absolutely phenomenal. And I'm so, I'm so just thrilled to be a part of it. And uh, I'm excited about today. We are uh, going uh, into a brand new message series, as you saw on the screen. It's called Be, Become, Do. And it's all about practicing the way of Jesus. I'm going to get into it. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. I'm asking God that in these few moments I have, you would speak through these lips of clay, the unsearchable riches of Christ that would build us up today and give us an inheritance amongst all them that are sanctified. God, we thank you that you are here. It's evident. We feel it. We hear you. God, we pray that you would continue to open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our spirits to receive something that would transform us from the inside out. This is our earnest prayer in Jesus' name. And somebody with faith set. Somebody with faith set. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed that when you look at people, people have ways that they do things, you know? Uh, maybe you, you know someone in your family, and when you look at them, you're, it's interesting, like, how they, they, their ways may be different than your ways. People have ways. Ways is one way that you can describe this idea of culture. That when you look at the ways of a nation, that's the culture. When you look at the ways of a family, that's culture. When you look at the ways of a church, that's culture. And what we want more than anything in our culture here is we want disciples. We want followers of Jesus Christ. We as a staff, as a group of pastors, we really believe here at Chapel Hill that that's our call. In fact, you can see it in our mission. We say we exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And a key word about that mission that we have is growing. And, and I just believe that the ways we do things, the ways we speak, the ways we live have everything to do with, with, with whether or not we're growing or not. The truth is we all have a way of doing things. We have a way of life. We have a way of seeing the world around us. So it, it really should be no surprise then that Jesus in the scriptures also had a way of life. He had a way of doing things. He had a way of, of seeing the world around him. And in fact, I think the early followers of Jesus were, were actually referred to this in a correct way because they were, they were actually called the way. They didn't call them the church in the beginning. They didn't call them, you know, Christians in the beginning. In the beginning, they were called, we were called as believers, as followers of Christ, we were called the way. Because we are those who believe, live, speak, and follow the ways of Jesus. Is this making sense? Some of this won't be new language if you're in the room and you're a small group leader or you're a part of one of our discipleship groups and one of our different uh, types of groups that we have. But I want you to lean in today because this really is the, 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 the foundation for what we believe is our discipleship process here at Chapel. This entire series, Be, Become, Do, over the next three weeks is going to, we hope, we feel, we pray, is going to allow you to scoot up to the table of ministry here at Chapel hill and the lifestyle of being a follower of jesus to understand the ways that you can live this thing out we don't just want you to be a cultural christian we want you to be a christian that is truly following the way of jesus the ways that he thought the ways that he spoke the ways that he lived and although the world around us they they're going to have their ways and their own way we are meant to live and practice a different way of life it's the way of Jesus. And let me just be really basic and elementary here up front in my introduction by saying it this way, that we believe here at Chapel Hill, and our small group leaders, this is going to be something you've heard before, that when we follow Jesus on the journey of discipleship, we're really called to three things. You could even say it this way, three goals. It is that we be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did. 
To show you what I mean, let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. It's on the screen. And Jesus is extending a simple yet profound invitation. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is, this verse, you might want to highlight it, underline it, circle it, do whatever you got to do, write it down somewhere else, screenshot it, put it on your phone, because what we just read, this simple invitation, is actually the framework for what a disciple is. If you've ever wondered, what is a disciple? How can I be a disciple? What's the way of being a disciple? It's right here in this invitation. Let me break it down for you. It's on the screen. When we, the first thing he says is follow me. And that word follow really is an invitation to come close to him. It's an invitation to close proximity. You could say it this way. It's being with Jesus. When Jesus goes on to say this next part of that sentence, that phrase, that command, he says, I will make you. Well, that, that's a statement of transformation. Like he's going to do something in us. He's going to create something in us. He's going to cause us to be something that we are currently not. He says, I'm going to make you. You could say that that's becoming like Jesus. And then we go into the last part of this phrase. And Jesus talks about making us into what? Fishers of men. So that is really the invitation for us to do what Jesus did. So we, here's the process, the pr to practice the way of Jesus, we have to be with him, then we become like him, so ultimately we can do the things that he did. And it has to be in this order. They flow out of each other. I gotta be so I can become so I can do. And probably what many of us have done, is, at least at some point on our journey with him, is that we've tried to do things that we feel like God has called us to do before we first be ultimately who God has called us to be. But remember this, as a believer, as a disciple, as a follower, being has to, it must precede doing. Being precedes doing. I have to first be who he's called me to be so I can do what he's called me to do. In other words, the fruit of being rooted in Jesus Christ is becoming more like him so if you look at your life and you can't really find a lot of ways that your life looks different today than it did five years ago and you've been walking with Jesus for those five years you might want to really take a good look at your journey and the process and what you're doing in your relationship with him to see man what has God done in my life that's caused me to change be transformed and look more like him so we need all three we need them in order and we need them together can you say amen when we do that, here's what happens. We are being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And so each week during this series, we're going to focus on one of these ideas, be, become, do. And so for our time today, we're going to unpack this idea that part of our formation is that we learn how to be with Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. I love this. It says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and followed and asked, or saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And look at what he says. He says, come and you will see. Folks, that is the same invitation he extends to us today. For those of us who want to be more like him, for those of us who truly want to be followers and disciples, his invitation is the same to us today. Come and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about 4 in the afternoon. Skip down to verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. There's that language. Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you. While you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So here's what I want you to catch from all of that. I want you to notice that Jesus, what he's saying to his would-be disciples, he's saying, come and you will see. In other words, come and be with me and you will see for yourself who I am for you, what I can be for you, how I can help you in your time of need. Listen, that was and still is the open invitation of Jesus to all of us. But what I want to get into today is I'm very practical with this teaching today. I want to get into this idea of like, but yeah, but, but, but how does that work for me? Like, how does that work for me practically in 2023? I mean, we're not living in the Bible days. We're not there with Jesus in Israel. We're, Jesus is, is not here in the flesh with us. So how can I be with Jesus? Because according to Matthew, you know, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So how can I really be with Jesus? Well, let's look at John 14. And what you're going to notice as we flip a few pages from John 1 to John 14, one of the things you're going to notice is the closer Jesus gets to the cross the more he starts to talk about how he has to go away, but in his place, he will send the helper, the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 through 18. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. That word advocate in the Greek is incredible. One of the translations literally means Jesus is saying this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another one just like me. Wow. You know, God is three persons. It's, it's one God. Not in three modes, but in three persons, all at the same time. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, wrapped up in one. And he says, I will give you another one just like me. When I leave, I'm not just leaving you. I'm leaving you with me in you still. Are you seeing this? To help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. He says the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Amen. Skip down to verse 25. He says, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the other one just like me, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So according to Jesus, the way that we can be with Jesus today is via the Holy Spirit. And so what does this mean? Well, let me show you how John Mark Comer puts it. He says the first and primary goal of apprenticeship to Jesus, a.k.a. discipleship, is learning to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. He says, this is going to happen because you're in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. This is the baseline for all things following Jesus. Come and be with me. Now, Jesus goes into a metaphor as we flip another page to John 15. We're doing a Bible study. Let's look at it together. John 15, 1 through 8, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. And I'm going to keep reading this, but I want you to notice this language of remaining. Other translations that may be familiar to you say abiding, abiding in me as I also abide in you. He says no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He's saying you can't have fruit unless you stay with me. Verse 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Hello. If you do not remain in me, abide in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. 
if you remain in me, if you abide in me, and my words remain in you and abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to do what? To be my disciples. You can't be a disciple if you're not connected to the vine. You can't do what Jesus calls you to do if you're not in a place where you're being with the one who calls you. You've got to be connected to the source. So he's using this metaphor of remaining or abiding in the vine. And in this one little teaching, he actually uses that phrase, remain in me and remain in you and abide ten times. He is driving the point home. He's saying to us, get into the Father's presence and stay there. He's saying, get into the Father's presence and remain. Abide there. Root yourself. Ground yourself. Center yourself in his presence. How long? All day long. Now, this doesn't mean you lock yourself away in a monastery somewhere. Okay? Because that doesn't really line up with what Jesus taught that doesn't really line up with what he ultimately called us to do. Because remember, we're being formed into his image. How? For the sake. Why? For the sake of others. So he doesn't want us to just get in a prayer closet somewhere and never come out and talk to anyone or do anything. That's not what I'm suggesting today. But we do have to, first and foremost, understand the power of what that means and what happens in that place so that we can go and be all that he's called us to be. So this comes down to kind of like John Mark Comer said in his book that I quoted a moment ago, it comes down to us learning something that may seem very difficult, but I want to suggest today it's possible. We have to learn as believers. We have to learn if we want to be disciples. We have to learn how to be in two places at once. Growing up, people used to tell me, well, Daniel, you can't be in two places at once, you know? But that's just not really true when it comes to spiritual matters. Because this morning, I don't know about you, but every morning, every morning, okay, I have a cup of coffee. This is how I get down. Don't judge me. I have my coffee. But do you know, every morning, unless my schedule is something I didn't expect, every morning I have my coffee in the presence of the Father. So I'm two places at once. I'm having coffee, but I'm with Jesus. When Sometimes when I'm on my commute, sometimes when people ride in my car, they say, like, you don't, like, listen to music because I got, like, nothing on iTunes or Apple or Spotify, none of that going on. I'm just driving silence. And it's just because that's part of my routine. A lot of times when I'm driving, that's just time for me to be quiet, and I just am in silence, and I'm just processing things. And so sometimes on my commute to and from work, I'm just in the presence of the Father. Last night, watching the Alabama game, <sighs> trying my best <laughs> in the presence of the Father. I was like, Lord, help me to not say some things I shouldn't be saying right now because I'm upset <laughs> in the presence of the Father. I'm an Alabama fan. Y'all just pray for me. It'll be all right. <laughs> what about when you just do menial tasks, picking up the dry cleaning, sitting in the car line at your kid's school? I want to suggest, maybe you've not looked at it this way, but you can do those things in the presence of the Father. Let me just go back on my notes to what John Mark says. He says, he says, it's learning to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. So it's just learning. A disciple learns how to be more sensitive to and aware of what the Holy Spirit is saying and what he's doing in your life. This is learning how to be centered, focused, rooted in him all day long. And by the way, this kind of language is found all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and in the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament and even some of the apostles. Jesus called this living, this lifestyle, abiding or remaining with him. Paul the Apostle called it prayer without ceasing. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, that at all times I'm praying. Yes, when I'm out and about. Yes, when I'm stressed and worried. Yes, when everything is going great. Yes, in my quiet time. But yes, even when I can be distracted, I'm aware of and I am listening to and I'm sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing and saying. Also, another man that you may have heard of from the 15th century called Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence wrote some incredible things around this idea of practicing the presence of God. And if you don't know much about him, he was a 15th century Parisian monk. And he devoted his life to these teachings about practicing the presence of God. 
In other words, remaining and abiding. Now, what you need to know is, even though he was a monk, he was not a priest. He was actually what they would call a lay monk, which I think is kind of funny. But his job, his responsibilities weren't around leading the people. It was, he was a dishwasher. He just worked in the kitchen, washing the dishes. And as he did that over the years, and he did just his faithful tasks, he had this, this incredible proximity and relationship with God. And he wrote many letters to people all over Europe talking about practicing the presence of God. And I brought a quote from one of his writings. It's on the screen. Listen to what Brother Lawrence says. The time of business does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things. You see what he's saying? All the hustle and the bustle and the noise and the requests from everybody in my life. He says, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees. So he understands the power and the sacredness of being in the presence of God. Why? How do I know that? Because if you really study his life, he was actually a a Catholic monk. And so their whole religion of coming to God had so much to do with the sacrament, right? And so daily he would have this holy time of of devotion and communion with the Father. And for these guys, these monks, nothing was more holy and precious than this time, listen to me, with the Father. But Brother Lawrence is saying, that time and my time working in the kitchen, I can have the same relationship, proximity, closeness, sensitivity, as if I'm on my knees, taking Holy Communion, praying in the presence of the Father. He says there's no difference between that and when I'm doing my normal activities. Folks, this is a wake-up call for us in America because what we do is, is we kind of subjugate God to these areas and these parts of our lives and we come into this room and we have this spiritual moment and so we can check it off the to-do list and we go back to our life and there's so much noise, there's so much going on, there's so much activity, there's so many needs that we get so consumed with all the other stuff that God's not a part of it. And what I want to tell you is God wants to be in the middle and in the midst of every part of your life, like we talked about last week, what real integrity looks like, that he's integrated in every area. So he said, I possess God even when I'm doing the dishes. I don't know about you, but I want this kind of relationship with God. I want to be sensitive to Holy Spirit in everything that I do. That no matter how busy or noisy or loud life gets, that God doesn't get left out of it. Can you say amen? Amen. So how then is it possible for me to somehow be with Jesus throughout my day? I mean, is, is, is is this even practical? Like, how can I do this, Pastor Daniel? Well, I think we need to first of all understand that it's not going to happen in one day. It may not even happen for you in one week. I believe what I'm talking about today is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of practicing the presence of God. We have to be committed to it. We have to be committed to this idea of practice. We talk about practice. Alan Iverson wants to preach. We talk about practice. Practice. Four of you will get that. It's fine. (laughs) We're talking about practice. Practicing what? The presence of God. And I don't know about you, but I I, I think it's important for us to realize that if we want to live the life that Jesus lived, we have to be willing to adopt the lifestyle that he lived. Uh, Like, if we want to live his life, we have to adopt his lifestyle. The way I can illustrate this is, like, I go to the gym every now and then, you know, twice a year, okay? And when I go to the gym those two times a year, you know, like January 1st and some other day someone invited me, you know, I, I walk in the gym and, you know, I know how to, like, dress the part. Like, I got, you know what I'm saying? I got the stuff and the gloves and all that. Like, I'm going to really use it. But I, I got all the things. But when I go to the gym, I, I look around and, and I see these dudes, I mean, just, just jacked, you know, just no body fat. They can have a shirt on and you can still see the six pack through the shirt, like, you know, because it's so tight, you know, and I'm just like, just, just lean muscle mass. And when I see those dudes, you know what I say? I say, I want to look like that. I want to like that dude, you know, 
But then I consider what it's going to take to look like that. Not a day, not a week, a lifestyle of working out and changing your diet. <laughs> Those dudes are eating fruit, nuts, and lettuce, and maybe a crouton, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to go to Chick-fil-A and get that new chicken sandwich with pimento cheese and a little peppers on the bottom and a little honey drizzle. You know what I'm talking about? Thank you, Holy Ghost. I felt the anointing right there. That's me. That's the lifestyle, Pastor Jonathan. I've adopted. Praise the Lord. People keep telling me, as you get into your 40s, brother, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but what do we know about this? This is so true. It's no different than other things. Like, I know several young men who say, like, Pastor Danny, man, I want to play golf, man. I know you and Pastor Jonathan, y'all go play golf all the time. I want to be able to hit the ball like you guys do. Listen, I'm not bragging, but me and Jonathan have been playing for over a decade. We've been playing close to 20 years, and we're still not that good, okay? You're not just going to pick up a golf club and be Tiger Woods because you want to. It's not going to happen. What am I trying to illustrate? I'm trying to get us to understand that if we want the life of Jesus, we have to be willing to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. So I'm going to help you today. I'm going to get real practical for a minute. Because I'm not standing up here trying to somehow suggest that you can die for the sins of mankind, that you can li live a sinless life and never mess up. That's not what I mean by adopting his lifestyle. What I mean is let's look at the ways Jesus practiced the presence of God. Let's look at the ways Jesus practiced being a son of his heavenly father. And when we, when we see his choices and his lifestyle, the way he talked, the way he lived, the way he walked and journeyed through this life, we can adopt some of those principles into our life so that we can experience the kind of life that he had. So I'm going to give you some practical examples on the screen. These are what we are calling in this series the practices of Jesus. But these are what most people would call spiritual disciplines. So here are some examples. There is not some exhaustive list somewhere that says these are all of the disciplines. Like there are many, but here's just some examples. Silence and solitude. Getting into a place where you have no agenda, you have nothing to say, you have no prayer list, you're just in silence and solitude. Now, if you don't do this, when you try this this week, it may feel really weird and a little bit awkward. Let's practice. We're only five seconds in. You feel that tension? Hundreds of years ago, they wouldn't have felt that tension in a gathering like this because they were much better getting into a quiet, silent place of solitude and allowing God to have a chance to have a moment to speak to you. I don't know about you, but I am deeply convicted by this. As I was preparing this week, I realized, Lord, I make a lot of noise. If I'm honest, a lot of times my prayer time, like many of yours, I, I got a list things that I thank him for and things that I ask him for. And so that's what our prayer life can look like sometimes, you know? Lord, I come before you and I want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for my family. I want to thank you for my marriage. I want to thank you for my kids. And Lord, I'm praying right now that you will help me today as I go and I go out through my day. Help me to look more like you. God, I pray you help me in my marriage. Help me to be better. Help me to be a better dad. Help me in my finances. Help me in my body. Lord, lead me in the name of Jesus. Lord, do you have anything to say? No, good. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. It's like, am I telling the truth? Like, there's some of these lost disciplines in Christianity that we need to implement today. I think if our church does this, our church will not only explode in growth because we'll have disciples making disciples, but our church will explode in spirituality where the kind of thing that happened a moment ago in worship is going to be more prevalent and it's going to happen more because we'll have more of us that are sensitive to what God is doing. Silence and solitude. Let me keep moving. Prayer, fasting, reading scripture. Let me say something about reading scripture. What I encourage a lot of people to do, especially young people who come to me and say, hey, I, I, I'm just trying to learn how to read my Bible, and can you give me some tips? One of my favorite tips to give is stop trying to read 15 chapters a day so you can read the Bible in a year. You don't need to do that. 
That's great if you feel called to that and you can do it, great, awesome. But, but maybe right now what's more important is that you just find one verse and let that verse get on the inside of you and you carry that with you throughout the day. If you do that every day in a week, you got seven verses. That's pretty good. You might start memorizing some of those verses, but what happens is sometimes we're like, you know, we get so zealous, you know, and I'm guilty of this. So I'm going to read one proverb a day and one psalm a day and one chapter of John, and I'm going to go to the Old Testament. And, and it's like if someone asked you at lunch, like, what would you read today? I don't know, a bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of stuff. It was great. Well, tell me about it. I don't know. It was awesome, though. I just felt the Lord. Like maybe this week we could slow down. That's really going to be a big theme. Slow down, give the Lord some room, and listen. So there are many others, but for sake of time, I'm going to kind of keep moving here. But I have to be clear. No matter what the practices are, no matter what the disciplines are, hear me. They are only a means to an end. In other words, is the point of reading your Bible to read your Bible? No. It's to let God transform you so that you live out what's in those words. Is the point of fasting not eating? No. That's called going on a diet. The point of fasting is to crucify my flesh and its selfish desires, to submit and surrender something that I really want. Naturally, physically, I want that food, but I'm going to give up lunch today to get in silence and solitude and pray and read my Bible. That's the point of allowing God to change you, crucify the flesh and its selfish desires, and let the Spirit be more important to you. See, that's what fasting is about. Reading scripture, Sabbath keeping, all of these things are so, so important. And I think while we're on this topic, Sabbath keeping is, is, is another lost art in Christianity, man. Like a lot of us just think Sabbath is just like uh, uh, Sunday is Sabbath. No matter what I do, Sunday is Sabbath for me. Or maybe for you, it's Saturday. But Sabbath truly is about two things. It's about rest and worship. Jesus never missed a week of Sabbath. Do you know what that means? That means he rested and he worshiped. That's why I think weekly church attendance is a great spiritual discipline to adopt because that weekly time of coming into this house is the same thing Jesus did every week when he came into the synagogue to pray and to be with God and to let his soul be refreshed. If Jesus needs that, come on, we need that. So as we be with him we become like him so that we can do what he did and I want to just suggest that for a lot of Christians what we've done is is we've tried to take spiritual fruit and we've tried to by our own efforts and works attach it to the tree just imagine imagine someone taking an apple wrapping some duct tape around it and then taping it to the branch and then you walk along and you see that person duct taping all of these apples to the tree. And that person says, look, fruit. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, that's fruit. But that fruit is not going to last because it's not connected to the source. It's not connected to the vine. And what I'm trying to get you to see is, is we do that as believers. Let me help somebody. Oh, look. Look, I, I, I'm serving. I'm on a serve team now. And, and, and look, I, I'm giving to kingdom builders. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pledge a kid for the bike thon and, and now I'm coming to church every week. And now I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing all these things. I'm helping my brother in need. I'm, I'm serving in the kids' ministry. And, and, and if you do all of those really good things without being connected to the source, here's what's going to happen. It's called works of the flesh. And even though it looks good to everybody else, you're not doing it with God. You're trying to do it for God or for people people and what's going to happen is that fruit is not going to be the type of fruit Jesus talked about because when Jesus talked about fruit he said this fruit that remains and so many of us oh, are caught up in what we can do for God I want to encourage you to flip that thing and start thinking about what I can do with God I'm doing it with Jesus I'm not doing this because I have to I'm doing this because I want to I want these things so as I get ready to land the plane, how can we really do this? How can we start this practically tomorrow morning when we wake up to start our day? We have to be willing to do what Jesus did. This lifestyle of practicing the presence of God. So we can look at Jesus, we can look at his ways, we can look at his life, and at the same time, we see him fully God. We also know that he was fully human. What does that mean? That means if you want to know what God looks like, 
look at Jesus. But if you want to know what a real, true human being should look like, look at Jesus. Because he shows us. So what are some things we see in his life? He was never in a rush. He was never in a hurry. Yeah, he spent a lot of time in community with his friends and family, and he loved to be a part of those gatherings. He loved to eat meals with people. Thank you, Jesus. I got that one down, you know. He loved to be with his friends and family, but he also knew that he had to find times to be in silence and solitude. So imagine, he's with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he says, hold up, I'll be back. And he goes away by himself so that he can process his feelings with the Father. You and I have to do that. Just as much, dare I say, more than Jesus did. We got to be willing to get into a place where God can speak to us. And Jesus also, of course, Sabbath, and he also had peace. A lot of us are, are, are so busy. Can I make this real? This is so convicting. Many of us are so busy. Our lives are go, 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 go. And some of us are so distracted. The average smartphone user is on their smartphone two hours a day, and that doesn't include the time they're talking. That just includes the time they're touching the screen. Over two hours a day, the average person. Digital addiction is becoming a real thing in 2023. A lot of us don't sleep enough at night. We're, we're cramming so much into our day, so much into our week. We don't Sabbath. And then we wonder, why am I so stressed? Why am I so anxious? Why don't I have any peace? But you need to understand, peace doesn't come just because you want it. Peace comes as a byproduct of being with Jesus. He is, after all, the Prince of Peace. Listen, I don't want to guilt anyone today because I feel guilt myself. As I'm preparing this, I'm like, Lord, where can I make room? Where can I eliminate so that I could commit to some of these practices? So let me encourage you how he encouraged me this week. I want to encourage you to maybe today, maybe tomorrow, here's the homework. Take a moment and write down some disciplines you can engage in this week. Maybe for you, it's just one. Maybe it's just that silence and solitude. Maybe for you, it's prayer and actually taking time to listen after you speak. Maybe it's scripture reading, and you're going to commit yourself this week to reading a verse or two or three verses a day and carrying that with you throughout your day and being aware of what you read and aware of how that applies. When somebody talks to you in a way that you want to talk back to them in some words that you shouldn't be speaking, just remember what he shared with you. See, that's how we do the things we wish we could do because we first are being who God has called us to be. So as you make that list, what's going to happen, I believe, over the next few weeks, you're going to slowly add to it. You're going to add in some new practices to live this way. Listen, we have to slow down. Maybe it's starting with 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day to say, Lord, this is the time where I, no distractions, no phone, no agenda, no day planner, no calendar, no to-do list. I'm just here, and I'm just with you in your presence. If you want to pray, that's fine, but don't make it about an agenda. If you want to read the scripture, that's fine, but don't make it about a Bible reading plan. Not this week. I want to encourage you. Practice just being in his presence. I'll close with this verse, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, as the band comes. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will, this is the promise, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Before we walk out those doors today, we're going to practice. What I want to encourage you to do is, Pastor Andrew and the team come in just a moment. They're going to lead us in one last song today, just for about two, three minutes, and then we're going to close. Can I encourage you in this moment? Make what we're about to sing more than just words. Make this a response. Say, Lord, I know there's a lot of things in my life that I'm not doing right, but God, I want to take a few moments right now, heads bowed, eyes closed, and I just want to focus on you.
I'm sorry, Lord, for the ways I've missed it, for the ways I've tried to make worshiping you or being a Christian about all these other things, God. And I'm sorry for being so distracted. And I'm sorry for all the clatter and all the noise. And God, I'm sorry that I haven't even given you five, ten seconds just to speak to me after I speak to you. But Lord, I want to be formed into your image. And so, Lord, I want to start here by just simply being with you. God's going to do something significant in these next three minutes. I want to encourage you from the front to the back, side to side, let's all stand up on our feet together and we're going to worship the Lord in this song. I want to pray for you. Come on, all over the room, stand up. If you're watching online and you can, feel free to stand where you are. Father, we want to be in your presence where there is fullness of joy. Have your way in us. This is our response in Jesus' name. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here on your feet Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Though I'm not here for blessing
I'm sorry for any way I've made coming to you and being with you more about me. Lord, I'm sorry for when I've convinced myself that because of all the good things I do in my week that somehow that makes me worthy. <laughs> Lord, I pray for this church that our doing would come from a place of our being with you so that we can truly become more like you and so God so that we can do what you've called us to do this this is my prayer God this is the reason why we are teaching this series over the next three weeks God I pray that those who call Chapel Hill Church their home would not miss one of these teachings they would lean in every week they would lean into that weekly Sabbath of being in rest and also in worship God, would you train us, raise us up into who you've called us to be. God, I believe this is so vital to our Christianity and it is so necessary if we are truly going to be formed into your image for the sake of others. God, help us to remember it's not just about us. It's about those who don't know you yet. Lord, I thank you for what you've said, for what you've done not just through a sermon, but through the Holy Spirit speaking to the hearts of men and women today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Somebody say amen. Come on, if you got something from the Lord, put those hands together.